Hello and welcome to the Brainstorm Podcast. And now, your host, Sonny Perlman. Oh boy, I got a treat for you guys today um, to celebrate finishing a year of podcasting. I got to sit down again with my brother Kiwi, who is known to the world as Dr. Akiva Perlman, who, yeah, unless you've been under a rock, uh, you know that he's done tremendous things in the Jewish world, mainly training a huge amount of helpers out there by being a professor in Wurzweiler School of Social Work as well as running ODA, uh, as well as having an awesome private practice. Um, and people come from from everywhere to, to uh, speak to Kiwi or Dr. Akiva uh, about everything and anything. And uh, he's become quite a wise and well-known man. To me, he's my awesome little brother who we've always loved each other very much and loved talking to each other. And we got to sit down and talk some serious some jokies, but all loving. And uh, I always have a blast talking to him. And I really, really enjoy this podcast. I hope you do too. Oh, okay. Hey, Keith. Hey, brother. <laughs> What's up, man? I don't know why we don't record always. The truth is I do know why. So half the things we just said we can't say on a podcast. <laughs> I believe so. I believe it was like we were actually saying while having the conversation. I'm glad we're not recording. <laughs> right. Okay. We, we'll tame it down a little bit. Um, <laughs> it's good to see you, man. Really Can good. I make one comment about Kanye? Of course. Yay. I'm not very into the news, but how come nobody made a comment that there is no such thing as Death Con 3? It's Def Con, and 3 <laughs> is not even the highest. <laughs> Def stands for defensive. It's part of a thing for the army. <laughs> you know what I love and about <laughs> whatever you're saying right now? It took me a minute to like catch up to where your head was at. Here you go. Is that like the whole Kanye story is horrific beginning to end? And you're like caught up on the fact that it's death. He said death instead of deaf. He said death. <laughs> I'm just saying I get it. I get it. all the stuff is horrible. Yeah. And it's possible that some non-Jews dislike Jews. This is this is horrific and surprising to me. Yeah. But <laughs> shocking. Very shocking. Something very new. Didn't expect it at all. Yeah. But this guy has been writing lyrics for a long time. I mean, he probably takes words a little seriously. <laughs> How come nobody pointed out that Death Con? Like maybe he was saying something good. Nobody knows. It doesn't mean anything. <laughs> That's it's what true. I'm trying to say. I, I you're right. You're right. He's a writer. He's a poet. He should know that. Meaning, it it makes sense that he's sort of <laughs> trashing the Jews. You're like, like I mean, you're saying, there's, there's historical context. In context, I'm getting what he's trying to say. Right, but you don't get the fact that he said just death. say Defcon. <laughs> just say Defcon. I mean, I don't know. I think you you. It's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why this. Is, I literally am sitting around going. Somebody's got to say something. Even like, like reporters are writing articles about this, and they know, like how horrific is what he said that they'll just skip over the fact that he said death con. That's what I'm trying to say. You're saying because it's expected, it's not really that horrific. And the reality is, a writer should not say death con. It should be deaf. It should be deaf con. <laughs> everybody knows. Not everybody knows this, but he should have done a little research before that tweet. That's all I'm saying. Right. <sighs> hey, do you Keith, feel better now? How you doing? Sort of yes, because I wanted to get that out for, since the story <laughs> started. Literally, and nobody has said it. I've been sitting around hearing people talking about it. He hates Jews. And he's a Nazi. He's all this horrible stuff. And nobody was like, his grammar is completely off. His, the words aren't right. Right. But are you saying that, <laughs> like, does that does that stuff bother you? Like when, I don't know, in the news there's... Someone saying something horrific about Jewish people. Oh, in seriousness. I think part of the reason that bothered me, the, the death con thing, is because I don't want to take it seriously. So we'll talk about the fences. If you want to really get down to it. Um, 
I think that most people like to have that thing. Uh, everybody's a little bit racist on the Avenue Q. Did you ever see the? They have yeah. an Avenue Q is a show. Anybody want to watch this up? And they have a song called "Everybody's a Little Bit Racist," and I think it's a fantastic song, and it's true. Like we all have some racism in us. Yeah. Um, some of us have been raised with a tremendous amount of racism, and especially people who like were raised in a blame type of culture. Like the reason we are suffering is because of something. Right. Even like therapy, right? All therapists, so we could go in. in therapy. There's a lot of a culture of the reason I'm this miserable is because my mother and my father and my grandmother and how I lived and trauma. And there's a tremendous amount of blame culture. Which could lead to like a victim mentality idea. Like I'm a victim of all those things and I can't. So right. I believe when you're raised that way, um, you start thinking, well, what's the reason for all my misery? It's got to be something else. It's not me. And that fits into racism, sexism, misogyny, all that stuff. It's like, well, I'd be happier if women would just behave themselves. I'd be happier if this culture wasn't so uh, criminals or whatever they're doing or they like a certain food or whatever craziness that you come up with. But it's like this blame game. So now you take a guy like that, you give, you mix her in a little bit of mental illness, which I think uh, with this Kanye situation, it is I mean, I've dealt with many people in, like, a manic episode. This guy looks like he's in a manic episode. Maybe yeah. it's been for years. I have no idea. But he's out of control. So his insides are coming out, and he's saying just these insane things. But I'm not at all surprised because I do think there's huge amounts of hidden hate in the world yeah. that people are feeling all the time. Do you think it's necessary to hate? To hate? Yeah. I was I think actually thinking need... this the other day. It's not, it's not, I don't know if it's necessary, but there must be something about it because we all do it. Yeah, I think, I think it's a part of the, um, the finding yourself, you know, part of life is we need to differentiate ourselves. Like there's, everybody thinks that they're right. Isn't right. that a crazy reality? Like the whole world believes that they're right, even though we all live profoundly differently from one another. But we all believe that whatever it is that we're doing is absolutely correct. If we're connected with it and we're deliberate about it. Uh, yeah. And and I think that notion is it like it's about self. Like you're wanting to affirm, you're wanting to believe and surround yourself by people that agree with your ideas. And I think there's a part of that equation in the discovery of self that is also about as you're differentiating, you're also disagreeing, you're also hating to some degree on another philosophy or another idea or another way of life. Right. So I, it seems to me that on some level, and I'm not sure how to rise above this, but on some level, hate is important. Like by hating, we're also loving. We're, we're hating something else and leaning a little bit more into ourselves, let's say. Or hating well, ourselves. Maybe like hate and else. disgust are like in the same area. Like if we don't, hate we have no way to get rid of something that's bad is that right right it, there's there's passion behind it there's there's meaning there's purpose behind hate i know we both work with with teenagers for a long time and this is a natural idea that you are like supposed to kind of hate your parents right the, the and in order Mahler, like separation and right. individuation so you need to separate in order to do it i gotta say you're not me but and then kids go and say kind of nasty things about their parents but here's the fascinating thing you you work i worked in oh right and then i i don't know if i mentioned this before to everybody but <laughs> i don't know if i mentioned this 700 times but when i work with kids from foster care they never say bad things about their parents at all this was always very fascinating to me if you get a kid who will not rank on like my parents did this to me my parents did this to me you know that the level is so unhealthy that they're not even safe enough to hate them so they could separate. Yeah. So they're so deeply in. So, like, it's when I get a guy who won't say anything bad about his parents, but they look like a train wreck, I'm like, this is worse than the regular case. Right. Where they can feel safe. Yeah. yeah we there's just like an enmeshment. There isn't a separation of self. It's like you a can. fusion. Yeah. You can't separate because if you separate, it's actually going to disappear. 
Like we could like push away our parents, but we're like, hey, push away our parents, but they're still there. Like we we know that they're still there, right? So we could separate. I don't know if this is connected, but I think if we if we feel it like personally, like we could hate our parents or hate, uh, you know, that I guess we, it could grow and be to other things. But what's the purpose? What's I think the purpose by, on a global scale? I think by hating, the, again, these are just raw thoughts. Yeah. Uh, but this stuff is on my mind all the time. Okay. Um, the, uh, by, by hating, you're also leaning into something else. So you're, you're hating a philosophy. I, I think you'll find this. With the more extreme societies, the more extreme, let's say, religious groups or um, cults, whatever they might be, they... Orthodox Judaism. At times. I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, but they... <laughs> they okay, you, you don't have to continue the sentence with Orthodox Judaism. Let's say more extreme people. Yeah, the, the more extreme you are, I think the more likely one is to hate or to disagree. Yeah, hate's a big word, but they're yeah. more likely to be highly critical of everybody else. I think, and and there's a parallel, because they're living a very uh, purposeful, mission-oriented life. In order to do that, you have to kind of demean, so to speak, or put down any other way of life that doesn't necessarily meet yours. And, and you never see that, uh, that bumper sticker. I've always been drawn to it. You know, the coexist bumper sticker. Yeah. It's got all the different religions. And there's a part of me that's always drawn to that because it's like peace and love and we could all learn from one another. And I think ideally that's how we should live. We should find a way to honor and respect the differences that exist amongst us. Um, but I also, there's another piece in it that I don't like, which is it's not very passionate. Like power of people who are just like looking to create you know, a sense of comfort and a sense of like everything makes sense and let's think about it. They tend to also not have the passion that we're speaking about, the hate, which gives them something that is very, very intense to live with. So if you believe in something strong enough, you can't just be all right with someone who believes something else. I think it, the, gri- the deeper your belief, the stronger the belief, the, more, the harder it is to hold on to another belief that's contrary to yours. Well, it's interesting because you're seeing it as a very positive because I see this also in a negative light. This could be the cynical light, which is that if I want people to stay in my little cult of intensity, then I got to put down everybody else so that they don't ever leave to go to those other people. So right. Maybe that's a negative. You're saying kind of a positive is that it's a natural thing. If you feel passionate about something, then the other things are kind of disgusting to you. Like you don't want to. Right. That- Right, but I think what you're saying is it's also true. It's it's you know there are many societies that control people um, to to keep them connected to their mission, whatever that might be. They don't really allow them to develop a self because that's. I I am so sad by this conversation. Yeah, I get sad a lot lately because I quit smoking. But <laughs> good for you, man. I'm proud of you. Wonderful. Yeah. So sadness is all the time for the last month or so. But I'm really getting sad because I I said earlier, like in another conversation I was having, that like I literally the other day I was just feeling so sad. At the end of the day, I just typed like, "Is there a poss?" I put it on YouTube. I want to see. Is there a possibility of us all getting along, or like, is there peace or no war? I wrote, is there a possibility that there's no war, like, in the world? And then everything came up about Ukraine and Russia. Like, nobody was talking about the esoteric idea that I was trying to ask. But it just seems to me that we're living in, like, I don't know. There's, yeah, there's 8 billion people, but we're just people. Like, there's more termites than people. Like, there's, we just, there's just a bunch of us. And we've come up with a billion ways to live. And it, and I really, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say a billion ways to live because I think every family lives a different way, even if they're in the same culture, in the same religion, the same cult, the same whatever they're in. And every one of us is 100% right. And we can't get along with each other. And the whole thing seems so ridiculous to me because the longer I live, the more I think that like, the big T, the big truth, is love. It's got to be love. Yeah. Like, I'm just, and we're, 
it's like almost is like a magnetic force pushing us away from it. Like it seems that way. Yeah. It seems super sad. Like why do I like why am I completely not phased by the Kanye thing? We'll go back. But what I'm not phased. Of course he hates us. And you know who else he hates? Everybody. Jews are easy to hate. But everybody hates everybody. You think the Nazis didn't hate everybody who wasn't them? They just hated everybody. Yeah, they're consumed by hate. Jews are, we're just always there and no one's there to protect us. We're like the vulnerable kid in the class gets bullied. There's no one, we don't have a place. We don't have, like, it's like, it's easy to hate us. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we, we're we have quite like, the target. Yeah, we have all these mystical stuff, but the truth is we're in everybody else's country always. It's never our country. And they hate, and they hate everybody. So we, they hate us the most. Like, I'm, I don't think it's, like, anti-Semitism thinks that they're the most unique, but we're just always the outsider. Yeah. There's ne- we're never the insider, and we don't even get to fight. We're a huge minority in, in, when I mean huge minority, not a very large minority in America. There's less Jews than many other minorities that are called minorities, but we don't get to fight for minorities because we're too good at what we do. So we're successful. At all. So you don't get to be a minority just because numbers don't make a minority. So now we're this little vulnerable population doesn't even get to stand up for themselves. Well, with this Kanye thing, maybe I'm wrong. I thought it was amazing to see what happened. You know, I always, I get most inspired by the first organization or the first person. I think it's easy to be the fifth organization to pull out from supporting Kanye. Right, Adidas. Um, oh, yeah, for example. Like, they were they were pretty easy. Uh, number one, they have, like, a long history of, of uh, being a part of the Nazi party, all that stuff. No, but it took a long time for them to pull out. That's what I'm saying. We're talking about probably billions of dollars lost by right. pulling out. That's not a simple thing to do. Right. Um, but the first person, you know, who stands up, you know, like all those studies on like social psychology where everyone could witness the same thing. They always have like the, the classic one where someone's on the street, um, looking drunk or looking not well and they're lying down and everyone just walks past them. It could be minutes without anyone responding. Right. I've seen these videos. Yeah. And then one person responds and immediately everyone else responds. Um, so that first person to me is the inspiring person. Everyone else then is just following the trend. So we followed the trend by not responding, and now we're following the trend by responding. Um, it's a nice thing to do. You're doing the better thing. But to be the first person is unique to me. Um, so I don't know the first yeah. organization, but I... I don't, know, I don't know the first organization was either, but I think a lot of the places that pull that... Like the people who have less to lose are usually the first. I, it's very rare to see a guy who's going to, you know, an organization like Adidas to pull out and they're going to lose immediately $250 million was immediate. And then it's, you know, ultimately it may be a lot more. Significantly more, I imagine. But yeah. So, like, they're like, they could have been thinking like me, like, okay, Kanye's out of his mind. He's always out of his mind. Like, he's going to come and apologize and you know, fix this, and then we don't have to lose a billion dollars. You know, like, I, uh, it's, I don't know. I, I'm not always so impressed by the first person because sometimes it's just some blogger who's, like, upset, you know what I mean? And then he's, like, getting the party started. And, like, who are you? you know, what did you lose? Would you do this if you were losing $250 million? I don't know. So I don't know. I, yeah. Maybe I'm not because we're in a culture where everybody is outraged all the time. What if it is? What if, like, meaning this is the most peaceful time in recorded history um, in terms of wars that are taking place throughout throughout the the universe, right? You're saying it's the the most peaceful? Yeah. We have, like, the least amount of people dying today, even though there's some terrible things taking place. Right. Definitely seems that way. Yeah, I think they have charts. I've seen charts about this. Like, we're we're by far in, like, the— Must be per capita. Yeah. A lot of people dying. Wise. Yeah, there's a lot of people dying in, right, in different right. types of wars. But when you, when you go throughout history, right. um, we're constantly in a state of war. Um, right. Borders shifting, you know, by every other week at times. Um, especially like it, near the Mediterranean, where like there was a strong, like a long history of of different cultures. They were clashing on a regular basis. But what if like there's a part of us that what if it is? What if, like, there's a part of us that also includes hate? And the objective is to try to work through that, overcome it, and arrive at the place of but love. But why do you got to overcome it? Do we have to overcome love? 
No, because love is a beautiful destination. Hate so clearly isn't. How do we know that? What I'm saying is that we all feel in it. It's so deeply ingrained in us. And then we all say it's bad. Maybe it's not bad. Maybe hate is, is as essential as love. I'm just throwing it's that possible. out there. It's possible. No, it's like we only see... I, Chev, our sister, I'm just saying that for the other people. Chev sent me a podcast today about... Um, about like narcissism and cults and interesting podcasts I'm listening to, and I and I always found it really fascinating that the idea of narcissists like we have no real books on how to help a narcissist. We have a million books on how to deal with if a narcissist is in your life and how to deal with that horrible thing that's in your life. Yeah, but we don't have any books about like how do you help a narcissist, which means like that's bad. Get rid of it. And maybe it's true. Like, I think we should figure out how to help narcissists, but that's a different story. It's like, we don't really have books on, like, maybe how why hate is awesome. Like, maybe hate is awesome. I discovered recently that anger is awesome. Yeah. I love anger. I, I, I've come to the point where anger is the one emotion that gives me a massive pep talk in the morning. Like, put your shoulders up. These guys are worth nothing. You're literally the best person in the whole world, and you could crush everybody's skulls. Like, I have, like, it's like, I wake up angry. I'm ready for the day, you know? Like, this is, it's like, you, now, rage, I find, is bad. You should not go and hurt somebody. Right, because, like, hate or, or anger under, like, without any control. Like, what is, like, so if I discover that anger, and I really believe this, that anger is a good emotion, and it's really helping me. Like, all those other emotions are, like, they're, like, either accepting it or, like, you know, like, or sad or, like, broken. Or like, there's a lot of sad and bad emotions, like, like negative emotions, and there's even positive emotions, like, I am hopeful and this. But one emotion that makes you, like, he's, like, your drill sergeant who makes you stand up straight and say that nobody in the world gets to put you down. And that guy who cut me off... He's not better than me. I am better than him, and he should respect me. <laughs> That's like a pep talk that I want to have, like, music in the background, like, of my of my anger speech in my head. You know, I want to have, like, do, do you, I don't know, those, were, those yeah. pick-me-up videos. So I've discovered that anger is awesome. It took me till I was in my late 30s to figure that out. Yeah. And now everybody feels hate. And we all say hate is bad. I feel like it's bad. I think I just think it's unevolved. I think there's like another way to get to the to the destination you're seeking through hating another. There's another way to get there, and I think that's love. Um, I think that you. That's you, exact opposite. I don't, I'm not sure it's the exact opposite. I think the destination is the same because, like, when you hate another. On some level, you're loving yourself. You see yourself as like like the cutting off analogy. You know, you hate that person because they disrespected you, and therefore I deserve respect because I love myself, so to speak. I'm valuable. Um, so therefore, you're not allowed to do that to me. So the act of hate is on some level affirming the love. And I think that it's just unevolved. Like there's a w another way to get to that place where you could de be deeply passionate. You could be alive. You could have all your own personal spiritual convictions and not be threatened by others. Where and I think that the mechanism is love that brings us to that place. You know, but I right. I think it's necessary though. I don't I think hate is so universal it must be necessary. It can't just be like, oh, let's cut that out. I, you know? I've never really read anything that says hate is necessary. Like I've never I've never read it. Like I don't well, how do we define that? I define necessary by if everyone's doing it, it must, it must be necessary. I may not be able to explain why, but if everyone's doing it, there has to be some point to this. So that's yeah, what I'm no. reflecting on. That's no, I agree. I'm saying it's just interesting that you don't really see it. Like I heard in a podcast recently, it was really interesting. Someone was explaining why we need sociopaths. because We always have sociopaths. Like, oh, there's always, like, a tiny percentage of our society of, like, people that really have no empathy and are doing 
horrible things than we have. And we're fascinated by them. You know, like we do a Jeffrey Dahmer thing on Netflix, and people are like, what is, like, we need to watch this. Yeah. So we're fascinated by these sociopaths. So why do we need sociopaths? And this guy was explaining that when you're living in a society where we're all, like, drinking coffee in the morning, sociopaths don't make any sense. But when you have to go on a raiding party to, like, defend your village... You need a guy who's going to hack everybody to death so, like, you could defend your village. It's one guy. Right. You don't want that guy to run the show. I actually saw in the Viking communities, the people who were the great fighters were never the people, the leaders. Mm. The leaders were, like, another group. Like, they, in the time of war, the war people ran, and the time of unwar, the other people ran. Like, there was an interesting, I read that. But it's... I, I thought it was, like, great. We like, oh, you explained the sociopath. Okay, now I understand. Now, could we explain hate? What is with this hate? We all hate each other. It's yeah. terrible. And now we hate each other for hating each other. Like, you see this whole, like, cancel culture type of thing? It's like, you're not allowed to hate. I wish there was video on me because, like, I, it's like the anger and hatred you see in people that are yelling at other people to stop hating it's like that parent who likes whacking their kid and say, you don't touch your brother. You know, they're yeah. smacking the garbage out of the kid. It's like hate is essential to even stop hate. <laughs> it's true. It reminds me of uh, Trader Joe's. And like when you think of Trader Joe's in your head, it's like this really evolved, you know, loving place about peace and organic and natural in the land. Okay. And every time I'm in Trader Joe's, I feel s- there's such an energy of like I've never I, I've gone shopping many times, but anytime I go to Trader Joe's for one reason or another, I feel like diminished and small and people are like angry. <laughs> like they're just these darts of rage coming in my direction. And I'm like, this is so antithetical to what it's supposed to be. Right. It's supposed to be like this loving, embracing place and so warm and fuzzy and accepting. And like people are like, well, if you do, if you don't follow the rules, whatever the rules are, right. or if you don't know them. You're like, could you, uh, could you box my groceries? I want to walk in there and ask me, like, do you guys box? Or, <laughs> yeah. Do you have boxes that are plastic that you could box my yeah. boxes in? No, okay. Do you have a plastic bag <laughs> instead of this hemp organic bag? What is that this? Work? Could you put this in plastic like a normal person? <laughs> I'm having such a hard time with this law about, like, no plastic bags. It's it, abusive. I, f- I literally feel like the only people who could enact such a law are people who don't go shopping. Like they, it's the most horrific thing you could do to people it who have that, like they a don't large have families. Family. It could be they don't have families. You go shopping and you like go in and get like a can of beans and like a loaf of bread and you go home. Right. That guy's like, he's, why do you need bags? Like, yeah. I'm, I'm good to go. I have a bag. This is my week's grocery. I always have a bag in my pocket. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and like, I want to bring that guy to like Seasons or something or one of these other stores. I don't know. Do you have Evergreen over here? Like. No one's walking around with a bag in their pocket so they could bring their loaf of bread home and, and some eggs. And how how are non-Jews not starving to death? I mean, I go into a store. Could I just ask this question? Uh, how are they not starving to death? Because I I can't walk out of a grocery store without a four hundred dollar bill. I I just it's impossible. I don't know how to do right, it. Right. It's insane. I actually have a rule. I go to Wesley Kosher here. It's a seventy five dollar rule. If I walked in for a bottle of Coke. I will walk out with $75 of stuff. I don't know how. That's a bargain. You know, that's that's if I want a bottle of Coke. If I'm going shopping, I'm walking out with $400 of food. And then I go into regular, like, non-Jewish grocery stores, and, like, we're buying on a weekly basis a full Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. Yeah. So I it's like one question. Why aren't Jews a humongous or not Jews like starving to death. Like why what is happening? How is it we're both humans, right? Yeah. You don't have to take this question seriously if you don't want to. <laughs> it's a <laughs> it's a legitimate solid cl- question. I wanted to get off the hate topic. Yeah, no, there was a sadness to that conversation. <sighs> but I, th- I I I don't know. I mean, just to cap it up, I think that everything has its purpose and we just need to keep searching till we find it in a way that makes sense and and i think there's a utility to it it's uh it's an affirming quality all right and, but then once you know the utility then you ask yourself the question of like is there another way to get there without negative pathways 
and and I think you can. I think one of one of the, I mean, so many people that I've that I've like encountered um, have been able to do this. But like Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, I think to him, he was a very passionate man, very much alive. But I think he and must have disagreed with many different ideas, um, and he debated people. Right. So he clearly disagreed, but he seemed to be filled with so much love and acceptance, and I think that he was able to convert that, and I'm aspiring to do the same. Yeah, he was. He did something very special. Yeah. He did something very special. But, okay, so first of all, I have a thought. I don't know how it was connected, but the thought was is that I keep having this struggle that and this is like I'm building this sober living. We switch it to sober living community because we now have several houses. It's unbelievable. Up, up three done, houses. Man which is awesome. Uh, but now it's like a community, and we have like people living in the community that are not in the houses but are still very, very connected. And I push in community and community and community, and then I, and then I start realizing, like, how is what I'm pushing different than, like, what cults are pushing? Like, like we're tapping into the same idea. Like, people need to be deeply, deeply connected. Right. And it, it seems... Like, I really, it like, it's weird because I listen to cults and I know how horrible they are. But a part of me is like, they are tapping into what we're all looking for. We're all looking for this. I don't know what I bring up. Let me switch the topic. Okay. It's so depressing. That's really depressing. I wanted to say this. The reason I'm very excited you're here, and I had Shim on last week. Yeah, I joined at the end. And you joined. That was a lot of awesome. fun. And in, we're doing doubles because you guys are the first doubles. I didn't do any doubles mm -hmm. like you guys were on last year. Is that I am celebrating one year of having a podcast. All right. Congrats. So I didn't talk about it yet. Zazie's, uh, Zazie's moving the mic. Making it impossible to be on the mic here. Zazie's delicious. She's the best. She's the cutest. Um, that's our dog who's joining us for the podcast. <laughs> um. So I was thinking, like, how do I celebrate a year of doing this? And I, first of all, I'm loving doing this. Yeah, I I love like every time I speak to you, it's like you're so passionate, it's on your mind. It's you're, so cool. You're really. I'm like, doing a million things. It. This is the thing I like to talk about. Yeah, yeah. This is where your your mojo is at right now. It's amazing. It's wild. It's and wild. I, and I love seeing you in your element. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, yeah. I get no greater joy than seeing you like in your space of joy. It's the best. Thank you. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, it's it's uh I love it. Just being here with you in this space, knowing like how sacred it is for you is like just an honor. It's amazing. It has been. I was telling you before that like this is probably the most vulnerable place I get in life, which is so weird. Not the most. I mean, obviously in a conversation I have with you or with my wife or like, you know, I could get more vulnerable, but in public like this is is wild to like I just people ask me a question and I'll just answer them as vulnerably as I can, which is Yeah. And not like fake vulnerable, like really vulnerable. It's been a wild challenge. Not sure if it's to my advantage or not, but I've been doing it anyway. But anyway, I just thought the best way to celebrate this uh year was to have all my siblings on. I'm gonna try to get all of them on if I can wow. Wow. pull it off in the next couple of weeks. Um, and it's then an I amazing idea. I think it's uh, it's metaphorical. I think there's I, we're all individuals in this. You know, we all have our own path that we're on. Yeah, but there's something nice about the fact that I think we're deeply aware of each other in 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 our own, you know, personal journeys. Yeah, and I I always feel like I'm on a journey with with you with with the family, so to speak. Right. You know. Well, there's like a deep deep love. Like, and there is a lot of times where there's, there's, like, we're really becoming different as we get older. Like, I mean, we have similarities. Yeah. But I keep thinking, like, there's really nothing I wouldn't do for my siblings. And it's not changing because we're all changing. Right. I think it's, it's, it's not, could get deeper. Yeah. It's more deliberate. Like, there was a time where I felt like we were all kind of trying to fit into similar molds even in our individuality, like there was like a family um, culture a little bit. And that, e that I think, is separated. Like it's not, there isn't a family culture the same way there has been. Right. 
right. but the love is not diminished. So when I think about like, I was on a podcast yesterday, and Shim said, um, "Shim, oh, the guy who invited me is friends with Shim, the guy who's making the podcast, Zach." It was this podcast. I will plug them right now. Um, called uh, Mislabeled, the label wiener. So the and and this guy Zach Adler and there's another guy, but he wasn't there yesterday, so I don't know his name. So they they asked uh, he asked Shim like, what should I be careful about talking to Sonny? Is there something I could do? And he and, they, and Shim was like, listen, just just talk to him. He doesn't stop talking, you know. Just. He's not he's, open the door. You're not gonna stump him. He's gonna keep talking, which is true. I always got something to say on everything. Um, and then he said, "But he will mention his Tesla and his wife." <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was really funny because I ex- exactly what I did. Yeah, of course. Uh, but I, I, that's the other thing I think between his Tesla wife and siblings, right? They're like yeah. always messing. I mean, Tesla obviously because it's a Tesla. Yeah, <laughs> obviously. Obviously. Is there anything you'd like to say today about the Tesla? <laughs> um, uh, it's such a wonderful car. <laughs> How do you feel about all it these drives other me everywhere. coming out? The other way? All these other electronic cars coming out. Like when you see them on the road. I'm all for does, it. Yeah, does it mess with your head? You I think all those like, EVs should just have a bumper sticker that says, thank you, Tesla. Like that. Like I love Tesla because he just changed the world. Like he's like now it's cool to have an EV, right? And there are cool EVs, like even cooler than Tesla now. So I just like I'm I, to me, I like I'm part of the revolution. Like, Does it not feel like blasphemy to say that out loud? Like there are other EVs better than a Tesla. Why? I hope they make better. Dude, in some ways, Tesla's way ahead of everybody, but in other ways, they're definitely uh, figuring out ways to like kill Tesla in other ways, right? Comfort and you know like. Like, all these conveniences. And, like, they're trying really hard. And they have. And also, Tesla's cheap. I mean, you have some of these, these EVs that are wildly expensive and do super cool stuff. Wow. No, I, I don't have a loyalty. Listen, the truth is, I've never had a fancy car in my life. Yeah. If you know. I do know. I just don't. I never had a fancy car. I loved when you <laughs> bought the Tesla. I thought it was like you. It's your fault. I was encouraging it. Encouraging. Like, yeah. You were the Bakaba Patish. <laughs> that was it. I was like, you got it. You got You it. literally said, Sonny, stop it. Just buy a Tesla. <laughs> yeah. That's what happened. And I was like, I came home. I said to Ellie, like, he says just buy a Tesla. <laughs> you should have a Tesla. And then I was like you spend so much time in your car. I immediately set up a, a, a like test drive right after that conversation. What are you talking about? You're like a hundred percent the reason. That's so, so awesome. So I was sitting I didn't there. Know that. You didn't know that? Not I told at you all. this, I thought. No, I was just sitting around like, yeah, I love this Tesla. Me and Gob Gob were like, uh, like looking up stats all day, and like, I've never geeked out about a car in my life. And uh, I was like, just, just get, just get it. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And you also like, like, it's not, it's not easy to do those things for ourselves. Sometimes, like, we could do all this for others, and then, but it, sometimes we need to acknowledge, I like this thing. It's my toy. I enjoy it. It makes me feel good. And again, I'm, I'm not overindulging in that way. I'm still embarrassed. Of your Tesla? Embarrassed of having anything good. Mm. Still embarrassed. Matter of fact, somebody yesterday said to me, ooh, I like your shoes. They're all like, they're like broken in leather, like, you know, like really rugged and really rugged. And I said, I, I like them when they look like that. But the truth is, these are really expensive shoes and I don't want anybody to know it. Because mm. I like I, re- I really don't like to wear any nice stuff or I don't know. I I'm remember when we, when we were younger, like I would try to get you like a nice pair of shoes. I can't, I can't stand you it. You refused to walk into the store. I remember one time I had to go into the store and buy, I think it was two or three pairs of shoes. It wasn't Gap. It was Gap. No, but Gap, there was a reason. Whatever, whatever your reason is why you don't go into a store. Do you remember the reason? Cause they kicked you out cause you weren't wearing shoes or something. No. <laughs> that was other stories. The <laughs> my reason for Gap is when I came back from America to America, I was like, I hate consumerism. I think they're taking advantage of everybody, and it's horrible. And I was like, so angry about this idea that we just have to buy new clothes all the time. And I said, I have to take a stand, and I have to 
I'm, I'm just going to pick a store, and I'm never going to go into that store. <laughs> That's my stand. <laughs> you just decided Gap was that store. And Gap was super popular then. Right. So I was like, I'm, I'm just, I'm never going into a Gap. That's a story. You, I think you were with Yehuda. I sent you guys in to get me shoes. I literally, I walked in. <laughs> no, I had to convince you because you needed shoes. And, and also, at the time, I don't think you were wearing shoes. Yeah, not a lot. Right. So you were walking around beer for most of the time. And um, <laughs> this was in Brooklyn and in Farago. Yeah. 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 It, was a, it was an interesting period. Whatever. And then so we <laughs> needed to get these shoes. And I walked into the store. I bought a few pairs. I brought them out. You were totally cool with this idea because you liked the this shoes. This was hypocrisy. Right. This was straight hypocrisy. You bought the shoes and you wore them. I think I wore them. Yeah. You but liked I, them. But I didn't go in. You, you refuse to go into the store. I want to tell you, I've grown, and I, it took me about 15 years, but I did go into a gap. But I felt really weird about it, so I went back out. <laughs> I went in for my kids. For a second. <laughs> and since then, I still... I Did you extend the ban to your kids? No, no I'm not. never that bad. I'm not a bad person. Yeah, I used to get a little bit, because Gap is not the only store that you've... Sort of banned. You've, you've uh, for other reasons. No, there you have different reasons for different, you know, different okay. experiences. <laughs> and I remember, like, and I was always very loyal. And if you said, like, and you should be, of course. Okay, I go never on. questioned that. But there was this one place that you banned once, and I think it's because you were playing backgammon. It, it was, was chess. You talking chess. about the baguette shop? The baguette shop right outside of town. You weren't happy about that band? I used to that get was baguettes, good baguettes there like <laughs> once a week. But there was another and one they like were right so next afford, door. But I had no money like to get myself food. And I had this finally, they, they made this great baguettes with with cold cuts. It was delicious. It, it was, was salad. delicious. And then one day you called me up. You're like, I'm sorry, Kiwi, but we I just banned that store. You can't go there. That anymore. was a full-blown boycott. Yeah, no, and, and no, that was that, it. And I never my, went back, by the way. But I really I, appreciate there that. There was a part of me that was just like... That's love. Dude, you like, you got to settle down. Stop. This is not okay. Well, this is when I had a lot of passion. There was a lot of passion. In me. He, like, that story was I, I was I was playing chess, and I had bought a baguette. And I was just spending too much time, and this angry Israeli, like... He's not angry because he's Israeli. I'm not racist. Not at all. <laughs> he was just angry, and he was also Israeli. And he, like, owned the shop and decided that I was there too long, even though no one else was there. And he flipped my chess game. Oh my get God. me out of there. Yeah, well, I... That uh, guy lost thousands of dollars because of that. <laughs> thousands. That was the most expensive flip he's ever done. Because I How many people did you... Did well, you besides for telling everybody that they can't go there anymore, and all my friends and everybody had to stop, Immediately, like there was a baguette shop two, three down. Yeah, right. No, so there were other options. It was almost as good. The hummus in that place, though, was significantly better than the it one was. Store. It was. There was a sacrifice involved. <laughs> and but I stood outside that store for about a week or two, with, <laughs> and just told everybody not to shop there. Yeah, like a sign. We were wearing. A sign. I don't know if there was a sign, but I I just said no. This one's not a good one, and I was like, you can't go shopping here. But there's one two down. I just stood there. The guy kept coming out and yelling at me. And I'm like, you shouldn't have flipped my chess game. And I was just telling every one of my friends, no Americans went back in there because I spoke English. And I was like, this guy is horrible. He flipped my chess board. He flips chess boards all the time. He's a chess board like killer. He's, he has chess boards in the shop. No, I yeah. think it was my chess board. He doesn't have chess boards in the shop. But he, I would, yeah. Yeah, so I appreciate I'm, the I'm like sort of questioning myself. Like, I've never banned a store, which which you have to question your passion. I really do. I'm a pretty passionate guy, but I've never really like banned. I'm wondering, like, have I banned? I banned an ice skating rink once. Okay, right, but but that's because there was. Why did you, you ban know, the ice skating rink? There was just a lot of anti-Semitism there. Is that the Long Beach one? Yeah, I banned it, dude. That place was not nice. It wasn't nice, right? It was some anti-Semitism in that joint. Yeah, and I think once one guy went after Shim, and that was it. That was the last uh, time I went to that place. Good for you. Yeah, I don't remember that. But that place. I, but bothered again, I, me. I didn't. I didn't do what you did. I didn't like stand outside and encourage people to go somewhere else. I technically there is a reason I had nothing to do. <laughs> I think I was homeless at the time. Like I didn't think there was anything I had to do. Right. Or maybe I did, and this just seemed more fun. 
Yeah. Oh, you also did outreach, meaning what do you mean? it's not like I went to the store and saw you there and you're like, oh, you can't go there. Like, you called me to tell me, dude, you can't go there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> like, there was you gotta be, this real passion, man. It's amazing. It's <laughs> I'm, like, debating whether or not I'm a passionate guy. Like, I mean, as we get older, we're done, man. All we got to do is run a clinic or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you can be it. passionate in that. I'm very passionate about almost everything I do. So but, but, I, but it doesn't extend itself to, like, banning things. Like, I think there's a line where I didn't, I didn't cross that line, and I'm, I'm actually questioning my passion. Like, maybe I'm not so passionate. If I don't care enough to ban something, what does that say about me? <laughs> okay you know maybe. we were talking about interesting like we were talking about the hate topic and i had one thought and it matches with this idea is that i remember the first time i got into a fight with yelly mm. um was i don't think we were engaged we were just dating at the time and we got into some argument about something and i then was like that night i was running with a friend and and, and i and i said I was in the best mood ever. <laughs> the best mood. And he's like, why is this a good mood? He's like, I'm like, you don't understand. I I got into a fight with Yali. And we disagreed on something so passionately that we were like fighting about it. And he's like, yeah. I was like, that's boyfriend, girlfriend. I'm like, you don't understand. I've been dating girls since I'm a kid, like a little kid. And I've never fought with a girl, ever, at any point, because I never cared what they had to say. Yeah. Like, I, I was so vanilla about, like, I just wanted to be in the relationship. So they said, oh, they'd say, like, I believe in God. I believe in God. I don't believe in God. I don't, I don't believe in God. I didn't have to take a stand on anything because I what they said wasn't important to me. Right. And I don't know if I stood for what I stood for enough that I cared. So I don't know. I'm just sticking this back into the kind of the passion thing. When you're passionate about something, you're going to fight about it. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's what hate's for. I think that's what I was saying. I think that's my yeah. feelings on it. Sorry, it took me like another 45 minutes <laughs> to figure it out. We go. <laughs> I get there. Yeah, we, we arrived. <laughs> I, lo- I loop around. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there's any truth to this thought, but I think there seems to be some truth, you know. That's like true. You, you, have to, you have to care enough about something to hate. Yeah. But then there's the higher level. Then you work towards the higher level of love. It always comes back to love with you. It's enough. So what's with what this else, love? What else do no, we I'm have? Around. It's, I, it's the same with me. It's all we have. Just make it fun. It's the only thing we got. It really seems like the only thing that really matters. I got to say, a lot of my friends are really getting angry at me that I keep talking about how much I love my wife. Yeah, they get annoyed. They start to get really annoyed. But I'm also watching them love their wives more. Yeah, it's, I think that it's, it's like a, a little bit infectious, you know? Yeah. they. It, it's not so fun to not love your wife. It's terrible to not love your wife. Okay. It's a terrible thing. It's less fun. Yeah. Yeah. I. It's it's wild how, how, like, we tapped in young. You did this also. That all that really matters is your relationship with your wife. I mean, man, that's... I definitely... Like, I think eventually people figure that out, but a lot of people don't figure that out until, like, way later. Yeah. I think we had, um... We had... What some really have? nice role models we, in that we, area. We grew up in a divorced family. What do you we mean? We did, I know, but I think, I think <laughs> the first, the first like, marriage we saw that was, like, infectious was... Gabriel was, and Chav. Yeah, Chav and Gav. His yard site's coming up. Yeah, it's coming up, like, next week or something. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and they, they, they were so infatuated with one another. They were just—I remember you and I. We went to Israel for something, something or another, and Chev picked us up, or God picked us up from the airport. It's your bar mitzvah, I think. Might have been it, it either, either mine or yours, one or the other. You were really my bar mitzvah. They were literally just married. I think it might have been yours. It's possible. Okay, and I remember they picked us up from the airport. And I don't know, they must have not seen each other for the amount of time it took him to leave his house, pick us up from the airport and return, probably a couple hours maybe. <laughs> okay. And I remember they got back, and 
And there we were. It was really exciting. We had, like, you know, that whole moment. We're hugging each other. It was wonderful. But then I think they sat on a couch and looked at each other. <laughs> and, like, completely ignored the fact that anyone else was around. And yeah. I remember feeling, like, profoundly uncomfortable, but at the same time, like, really appreciating it. Yeah. I think that was, like, the first, really, it was the first relationship that I saw that had, that worked and that loved. And, and I think that, you know, I think, in our family, when, when I got married, when you got married, when our other siblings got married, it was like a strong push, like love, love overtly, like right. work on this. This really, really matters. And there's permission to do it. I a hundred percent agree with you that yeah. I think we were all trying to be that. Yeah. Like it was, uh, I mean, Yali, when we were just friends, like I was constantly talking about that relationship. Like it was, it's it's funny because he died just a long time ago. Like we were, like when I we're so much older than they were. It's crazy. And if I went back to that time, I now it's like stuck in history. You can't mess with it. But I wonder how codependent the relationship was. You know what I'm saying? Like right. I may be like, oh, okay, that's a little too much, guys. He just settled down or something like that. But it, in our heads, it was just like frozen. Like it's possible to passionately love someone. Yeah. Just just passionately love someone and i think that is what kicked us off yeah i think it was like uh it's like a choice it's almost like the, i don't say collectively individually everyone's made a choice to say i want to love loving is a value that i want to embrace and bring into my life and and uh and i think we do it you know yeah we find a way to do it but i could say that me and you are definitely the most vocal about it in the family you don't think that's true no, I think it is true. Um, yeah. Like everybody at me is like, oh, Kiwi, love, <laughs> loves to buy. Everybody wow. knows. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Thank God. I do. Dearly. We're definitely the most vocal about it. Yeah. Well, I think also um, we also have a platform, you know, where we could talk about these things. That's true. You know, and, and people, I remember at the living room, for example, like, you know, we make these Shabbatones and, and Tamar was always there. And right. I also felt like it was a a good opportunity to speak about a value that really matters, you know. It wasn't just about like my own desire, like my own feelings, which it absolutely was, but it was it was more than that. It was so many people come from places where they haven't seen love and show them love, show them what that's like to honor and respect and care about another person. Right. So so okay, I'll ask you a real question. I think about this a lot. I don't even know if I know the answer, but how come people suck at it so much? I don't mean to say this, but like literally once or twice a week, I'm hearing about a divorce nowadays. Now I am hanging out with the wrong crowd. I will <laughs> admit that. I mean, everybody I'm working with is suffering yeah. uh, on some level, but like what, like you, know, what's the secret here? Like why are some people able to do it? like beautifully and some people are just like really like like it's the worst thing in the world to be married like what do you th you think is there's like a like an easy secret here or it's like like what is it i don't i don't think there's an easy secret but i th the one thought that i think really like resonates is um i think people kind of look at love like they they look at love as an experience that they fall into and it's something that you're supposed to feel like, that's kind of the way it's described or the way that, it, you know, Hollywood presents it. That, like, you meet someone and they complete you. And it's, like, almost like someone gives you an experience. Right. And I think that, you know, this as well as anybody else, that real love is something that is a value to some degree. Like, you work towards it. You believe in it. You pursue it. Um, you work for it. And when things are not going so well, you try to, you go back to the drawing board and say, how could I find that? And how could I nurture it? Right. Uh, and I think that that's an idea that is not at all presented. I think it's presented as, as something that, so long as it works for me, so long as I feel a certain way, so long as I'm treated a certain way, then all of a sudden love occurs. Right. Um, but I think it's much deeper than that. It's not something that happens to you. It's something that you embrace and choose, and you, you choose it all over again on a daily basis. You, you choose a life when you think about it. 
right. that a life of love is much more meaningful than a life of hate and a life of disagreement or discontent. And you then you'd ask yourself, okay, so then how could I get that? But it's it a seems, value. What you're saying seems so simple. Why can't, and I actually feel sometimes that it is so simple. Like I'm not saying I don't deal with all the stuff that marriage deals with. Right. It's difficult and there's complications and there's, you know, like disagreements. And all. But it seems such a no-brainer that I want to live a life of love that it supersedes all that other stuff. How come most people aren't thinking that? Like, well, I, I, I don't think I've done yeah. anything more amazing about love than anybody else. It's just that I constantly, like you said, that's not true. Um, I don't think there's a true there's truth in what you just said. Okay, you've done tremendous amount of things beyond what many and most people have done to acquire and to to be in a state of love. I don't think it's something that just no, no, it is, but it it's like it's it seems like it's okay. I'll put it a different way. You're right. <laughs> All over the top. That's the honest truth. <laughs> In, uh, but it seems like such, like, okay. I have, I want love. And my worst nightmare is I won't have love. Yeah. So my greatest desire is to have love. And my worst nightmare is to not have love. And I'm assuming that most people feel similar to that. Yeah. Because I, I, I mean, I speak to people all the time. When it comes down, you break down people's fears it always comes down to I'm going to be alone in my mother's basement at 53 years old with a, like a, like a ratty dog, you know, like that's, that's right. like the fear. And I'm sorry if you're listening to this podcast and this is what's happening to you, you know, go out, date, get somebody, but I'm no I'm kidding. But uh, it's, uh, it's really, I don't want to insult anybody, but that, when I break down my fears, like being alone and, and, and not having love seems to be like the top of people's fears. Or if they have love, I'm going to lose the love. That's the top. So that is my top fear. Like my kids asked me the other day that, like, uh, what happens if you, if if mommy said she doesn't want to be married to you anymore? Which is like a horrible conversation. But right. as your kids get older, they ask you horrible The enjoyable questions. conversations with teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> so I said, no problem. We already have an arrangement. If Ellie wants to divorce me, I just kill myself. That's that. And then we don't have to deal. I don't want to be divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be divorced. And my kids were a little taken aback. But I made that deal with her a long time ago. Right. This is a suicide pact. This is how it works. If you're a therapist out there, please don't get me committed. <laughs> this is, there was no plan. No intent. No intent. It's just that reality. I don't want to be a divorced person. And why would I want that? So that's... And I got to go find someone. Uh, like, no, no way in the heck. I'm not doing it. <laughs> so... <laughs> So my worst fear is to be alone, and my main, my, my main goal is to be in love. Yeah. Why wouldn't I spend every day trying to get that? I know this sounds so stupid logical, but that... But I, I, how many people do logical. you know yeah. like consciously Who would live disagree with, what with you that? Did? No one would disagree with it. I think people might disagree with like the, the whole the suicide, suicide situation, which is... Uh, <laughs> Oh man, I freaking love you, man. <laughs> I love the way your mind works. <laughs> yeah, your your way of living is just beautiful. And a little uh, crazy. Yeah, it's completely crazy. But so what? It's fine. You know who said? You know, normal and predictable. I'm right crazy. You get up at five in the morning. What am I supposed to do? Oh my god! That's how I. It's not I normal. Yeah. <sighs> You're such an adult. I can't handle it. Yeah. If I see five in the morning, it's because I stayed up all night. There's no way I'm seeing five in the morning any other way. No, but the idea of sitting in traffic for two hours when I could get there in 45 minutes just at an earlier time, then the question is, how do you, what do you do right. when you get there early? So, so you're saying the same thing as me. Like, your main thing is to get to work, and your biggest fear is to sit in traffic. So why wouldn't you get up at five in the morning and just go? That's exactly the thought process. And then the question <laughs> becomes... Actually, you just threw my logic right back in my face. Yeah. So then the question becomes, what do I do? So then it's been beautiful. I've been dialing and learning. The morning. And, and then you look at anybody else. Why are you getting up at 5 in the morning? You skip all the traffic. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I'm thinking No, but it is love. tiring. It is tiring. It's not It's not so simple. But uh, Well, the work I do for love is tiring, too. Yeah. Ex yeah. It's the same idea. Meaning because <laughs> it's a real value that you're living with. Yeah. And I think most people, I agree with you that if you ask them consciously, 
like to describe what's most important and what their biggest fear is, what they're trying to avoid, I think they'll arrive at the same conclusion as you. Yeah. But I don't think they're pursuing it the way you're pursuing it. I think they're pursuing their own, like their own wounds, possibly their own selves before getting to that place. So I don't, I think there are interferences. Like they'll agree, like this is the objective. This is the goal. It's like a uh, parenting in a similar type of way. Everyone right. would say like, it's the most primary thing. It's the most beautiful thing in the world. But there are other needs that come in that interfere with someone, one's ability to simply pursue that and only pursue that. Right. Like, I need my own time and I need my own space and, and my own needs are not being met, whatever that might be. So therefore, that takes center stage over what, what truly matters to us on a much deeper level. So I think you're living with what truly matters to you on a daily basis. I think for most of us... So is that a freak thing? It's a unique thing. How many because I think it's a freak thing because literally people look at me like I'm crazy all the time. They love it, but they think I'm crazy. I'm speaking to friends of mine. I'm like, you're already there. Like, the, you already have companionship for life. You made a pact with somebody, and here you are. This person, this you have someone who's willing to deal with your crappy personality for the rest of your life and they're excited about it and all you gotta do is make them feel good about it and they'll stick around forever and they're like i hate everything <laughs> well i think they're they're getting hurt and they're losing sight you're so empathetic i think that's what happens <laughs> to people i think these other other no, things, I get other it. needs kind of kick in you know and like and that becomes more important what if a person feels more grandiose at work than they do at home? They're more appreciated. They're more valued in that space. So they're going to probably, meaning with the wrong mindset, they'll focus more on their productivity there than they would on their actual relationship at home. Because know, it's it. comforting something. It's soothing something. Now, if you sit down and talk to them and say, hey, listen, let's, let's put it in perspective what really, really matters, then obviously they're going to say my home matters more than this environment. But in the moment, if let's say someone wasn't valued and appreciated and at work now they are, I'm not sure how much strength they have to fight that. Right. In that perspective. And I think that's the the quality I think that that you definitely have and, and if it's okay for me to say that I have at least a part yeah. of of uh like I I never lose sight of the fact that marriage and your home is the most important part of your life. And, and living with that consciously every single day. Like, that's what matters most. Right. And yes, there are other things that are really expressive of who we are and, and, and things that you can't do at home. Like, things that I do out in the world, which give me a lot of sipuk and a lot of, like, satisfaction and purpose and meaning. But, and, and I can't necessarily get that at home in the same exact way. Um, but it still doesn't distract from the fact that home is the most important place. That's where the energy needs to be. And we yeah. need to remind ourselves of that all the time. Can I talk about a more global thing with the same topic? Is that maybe, it's a thought I'm having while you're talking, which means I wasn't listening very well. It's not good. It's all good. Okay. No. <laughs> it's maybe, okay, so it goes back to my my thing that I, that I, I always talk about, how much I love my wife and all that stuff like that. And, and uh, people, like, kind of roll their eyes and stuff like that. And you have the same thing. So um, maybe success is, like, when you're mentioning work and stuff like that. Like, success is, like, if you see a guy and he's successful and he's, like, making money, has a nice house and all, and all that stuff, you're like, that's the success. Mm -hmm. And that's how the world say, sees success, you know? Like, right. TikTokers are, like, showing, like, that gorgeous house and you know, like all that stuff and maybe if we had a world that success meant good marriage right like that was success like you would come in um that happens with me sometimes you know yeah would be like uh oh, we could get this or that or something like it's almost like comparing comparing to like the rest of the world i'm like we already won we're the winners we won success <laughs> like we love each other and we live in a house that maybe we need a new couch, but we still won. Yeah. Like, that's like a detail in the world. 
Like, yeah, you got to have another couch. Okay, I'm not fighting that idea. But we already won, so why would you get down about it? It's because in my head, that's success. Yeah. Like, when I saw Gabriel and Chev, I was like, oh, okay, they won. They won life. The fact was that they had a refrigerator that didn't have any shelves. Yeah, I Because they couldn't afford a refrigerator with shelves. And there was no shelves. Like, everything was stacked on the floor. They couldn't fix. They were so poor. Yeah. And to me, they were, like, full success. Like, well, they were. We were building things out of scrap wood. Like, he, he needed a... I remember me and Gabriel were, like, in... I don't, I don't know if you were there or Ellie was there. I think it was before you came. So it was Ellie was there. Were they living there when you came? No. No, they were right oh, in South okay. Africa. So me and Ellie and Gabriel, and we, like, we... They had a baby that was so excited. And I think it was... Kali at the time, or whatever they decided, Gavriel decided he's going to build a baby table, a changing table. The, he couldn't afford wood or like nails. <laughs> right. That's where he was at. And we like literally went around the neighborhood, like found like, it was like, I found this board. Let's make a baby table. And it was like, we like, we using a handsaw and like nails that he found and you know, like a hammer that he borrowed, and we were like, and we built the ugliest baby table I've ever seen in my entire life. But they won, and I was like, that's success. Yeah, I could. But how many? In. How many people see the world that way, Sonny? I really? It, I honestly, I think everybody does. I think it's everybody. It's a different when way. they how look at me, consciously. When they look at me, and they look at you. They're like, that guy won, and they're not talking about our careers. Oh. Um, we have to I, stop. You want to take a? No, I. Uh, um, <laughs> one sec. Uh, Going over. Yeah, yeah. So I, I need to run in a few minutes. I didn't realize I could talk to you forever. Yeah, but I have this. Uh, I think I agree with you that everyone will will agree with that being the objective, the goal. And on a deeper level, you know, when you get to. You get to a place of what really matters in life. People are always going to say, like, what really, really matters is the relationships and the quality. And I think there's nothing more endearing in the world than seeing an older couple that, like, loves and support one another. And I think everyone would get everything they have to be that. But I don't think that people consciously live they with that They wouldn't objective. give everything they have to be that. I th That's what I'm saying. Right. They wouldn't do what it takes to right. get to such a place. But they, in theory, they would arrive at that place. But then... We need a question, like, if something really matters, what are you willing to put into it? And, and you're answering that question by saying everything. This really matters. Everything. This is how I define success. I'll be willing to give everything to it. And I think people in theory would agree with that, but living that and doing that and sacrificing for that and overcoming whatever interferences exist in that space. Is well, I think we have to bring it front and center. Honestly, I think a billboard in the middle of the street should have a picture of a husband and wife like they did in the 40s. In the 40s, you looked at billboards, and there was a picture of a family, and they were doing something together. And it was cheesy, and it wasn't as good as, like, a like a, a, a gorgeous, sexy woman on a billboard. Yeah. yeah. But I'm saying is, like, I think this has to happen on a more global level. I like, agree. it's, even though we're saying it's a value, people will kill themselves to make a ton of money. They will kill themselves. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Keith. Dude, I love you, man. I could We're going to stop here cuz you're super busy. I love you. I don't you. like being busy. But this morning was like not busy. I I took a nice little stroll yeah, it was and pretty chill. I drove over here. It was wonderful, but I, I had to get to this meeting. You know? I keep saying we could do this all the time. Maybe That's I'm going to maybe it's going to happen all the time. Okay. You're going to have to schlep out of here. We'll figure something out. It's not schlepping cuz I my life is like it's, it's awesome. just it's fast. So to me it's like it was a pause. The conversation I had with Tamara this morning, she was so sweet about this. Yeah. Even last night, she saw like I was so tired. She said, "Why don't you just take it easy in the morning?" And I'll, I'll, because I had offered. I said, "Let me, you know, she's she's working really hard, and um, let me just bring the kids to the bus. We have to drive them because we're not in our house now." And she said, "No, do you just sleep in?" And I was able to, uh, I was able to drive them because I was already up. So I'm like, "What's the point?" Right. And uh, but I was able to say like. You got, like, I was able to internalize what you gave me, so that's already here. It's not lost. You got the points. You got the points. The points are there, and the love is felt. And that's the whole point. That's it. Done. Period. You know, exclamation point. I want to, we have to, I, I want to pay for a billboard of a family. 
and just write, this is success. We'll start there. <laughs> look, look, look at the magazines from the 40s. Every, it looks like Every that, single, right? yeah. I never thought about this. I just thought of it yeah. right now. Like, you, I'm literally, like, flashing back to old advertisements. It was always like, and this is, it was families. Yeah, we don't, yeah. No, we don't do that anymore. No, it's not, it's not a universal value. Self has become the value. And that's why marriage has taken a toll. Because marriage is also about self. Ultimately, it's about self. But it's yeah. also about fusion and sacrifice and, uh, and considering another. And that's not the same value as what we place on self. And it's I'm, sad. I'm glad we talked about this because this, this topic is on my mind all day. Yeah. And I always talk about different topics. It's also the reason I can't do marriage therapy. Because I look at them and I'm like, come on, man. <laughs> just stop you, it you, you got it yeah. you got it can't you see you got it oh gosh like you want to get divorced and try to get it again and then decide if that's the one it is you already got it you did it you did it of course if they're sick you have to get divorced dude anyway freaking love man love you man it was love awesome you, yeah. it was really awesome and we'll do this again soon looking forward brother bye bye <laughs> Thank you for this day that I've been given Thank you, thank you Thank you for this chance Thank you for this chance to live a new